Great to have you on Renegade Inc. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. It's really difficult to sit here uh, as a white guy at a desk in a studio in London. Uh, and other than empathizing with what's going on in America at the moment, it's very difficult to find a way into this interview, to find a, a golden question to ask that other people aren't asking, to try and find the structural reasons for America uh, blowing up as it is at the moment. What is the sort of question that I can ask, a golden question, so, so we can understand what's really going on? Well, you know, it's, it's complicated, but yet on another level, it's quite simple. That basically, the uh, killing of George Floyd was a trigger, not just in terms of a response to the systematic uh, brutality coming from the police forces, but the structural contradictions that are creating the conditions in the, in the country in which uh, African-Americans are dying at, to the tune of hundreds a day as a consequence of COVID-19, unnecessarily dying because uh, our communities have been the victims of a neoliberal uh, regime that has closed down hospitals and allowed for industrial uh, plants to be cited in our communities, resulting in all of the underlying conditions that have made our people vulnerable uh, to COVID-19. So there are structural uh, this violence uh, along, along with the violence from the police that get culminated to a point where people uh, decided that enough was enough. And with the uh, African-Americans going to the, to the streets, uh, they were joined by uh, white allies and brown people and uh, LGBTQ people and everybody who are frustrated at what is happening uh, in this country. And is the unifying factor for all those people, regardless of race, religion, uh, gender, sexuality, is the unifying factor that neoliberalism has meant that they don't, or they don't feel that they've got a future? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I think that is the unarticulated phenomenon in the sense that uh, I think that's driving the resistance. Uh, but the, the, the George Floyd situation was sort of the the, the trigger point, the entry point, if you will. But uh, politically, those connections are, are being made because people in the U.S. have been uh, uh, subjected to a process of radicalization over the last few months. What does that it's mean? It's quite clear. It, it, it became quite clear to most people uh, who are now part of the, of the ruling class uh, that their lives mean almost nothing, that basically uh, their lives will be sacrificed uh, in the interest of, of capital, of saving the economy. Uh, so people are feeling the fact that they are, are cogs in a machine that they have no control over. So these kinds, this kind of, these links are being made in terms of a new kind of consciousness that's developing here uh, in, in the U.S. Is it uh, any wonder, though, uh, the U.S. for years has been going around the world uh, and rent-seeking? Uh, and it seems to me that the rent-seeking capitalist system in the U.S. at the moment, which has riven the country, uh, is because the rent-seekers have turned on themselves. They've turned on their own people. Exactly. I mean, you know, the, the, the chickens have come home to roost, that the, the contradictions of the neoliberal global order uh, have intensified within the U.S., that the plan to, uh, to reduce the U.S., uh, economy and workers in the U.S. economy to uh, low-wage workers without benefits and a system based on uh, plunder and pillage of the global South, uh, all of these contradictions are, are culminating. Uh, and so, you know, they, they depended on a, a population that would be uh, somewhat manageable, uh, but, you know, there's a trigger. And in, uh, this George Floyd thing was, in fact, a trigger, along with COVID-19. Unfortunately, though, in the U.S., um, left forces are, are very, very weak uh, uh, institutionally. Uh, and we are, 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 are excluded from the main sources of, of political discourse. So, you know, there's, there's uh, organizing taking place. There is budding new consciousness that I referred to a moment ago. Um, and that process of how that trans gets translated into a more effective movement uh, remains to be seen. There's some progress, uh, but we're also seeing that the state is moving very aggressively to try to, uh, to preempt 
uh, the possibility of real uh, radicalization. Uh, you know, you saw some of the symbols of that with uh, the police kneeling with the protesters and walking with the protesters. And, you know, the, they, they are trying to uh, erase the distance between the people and the state, given the impression that it's, all, it's only about some, some cosmetic reforms uh, and everything will be just fine. But people are making the right kind of connections. People are understanding that uh, the contradictions are only going to intensify and that uh, as a consequence, we're not going to see people abandoning the streets uh, anytime soon. Uh, but we do have to make a pivot away from the, the, the focus just on uh, George Floyd uh, to the system. And that pivot is happening, uh, is happening slowly, uh, but I think that it, it's going to uh, occur. And if it does, then uh, there's no telling what's going to happen over the next few months. If that is going to be that horrific death, if that is going to be a meaningful, uh, inciting event for fundamental social change across America, what does the new America dream look like to you? Well, the, the new American dream would be a, a, a reality that transcends the current capitalist nightmare. Uh, the only way that we're going to be able to realize our fundamental people-centered human rights is to shift power from the uh, uh, capitalist uh, oligarchy to the people. We have to have a situation where there's real democracy, uh, where uh, the economy is, is organized to address the objective needs of the people. So, you know, the, the, the dream of what the U.S. can be uh, transcends the current reality and what the U.S. will end up being in terms of whether or not it's going to be able to survive as a coherent uh, political entity is also uh, a question. I fully expect uh, for the U.S. to spin out into pieces. Uh, we already saw some of that happening uh, during COVID-19 with the collaboration of various states like in California and in the, in the Northeast uh, and the weaknesses uh, of the federal government. So, you know, what what the U.S. will be in the future uh, remains to be seen, but we do know one thing, it's not going to be the way it was uh, two months ago. You had a uh, tweet that went viral. Uh, you said the U.S. government is deploying the army, brackets. That's what the National Guard is against its own citizens. Isn't that now when someone calls for regime change if that was happening in another nation? There is really a massive uh, bit of hypocrisy, isn't there? Because if this, uh, the scenes that we're seeing uh, in the US, if that was happening anywhere else, you can uh, bet your bottom dollar that uh, the US would be intervening as quickly as possible and trying to help the so-called uh, people who are looking for liberation and freedom. Exactly, and that's why the Black Alliance for Peace uh, call for a United Nations uh, scrutiny and intervention uh, after uh, Donald Trump tweeted that uh, once the looting stars, the shooting stars. It became quite clear that uh, the authorities were quite ready to use lethal force against uh, their own citizens and residents. And yes, in other situations, uh, the U.S. would be out front, uh, especially if it was a state uh, that was at the crosshairs of, 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 of the U.S. Uh, destabilization uh, program. They'd be out front uh, raising the issue of, of human rights. Well, we say if there's going to be human rights standards, there should be the same standards for all nations. So let's bring in the international community to uh, scrutinize uh, what is happening in the U.S. We say that is it, it is an ongoing human rights crisis in this country, not only uh, impacting African-Americans, but also in, impacting other class people in this country and uh, the, the, the white working class. So we have a real problem here. So yes, one good thing that's going to come out of all of this in terms of the human rights question, no one in their right mind will be able to take uh, seriously any U.S. official ever standing up in front of a camera and talk, talking about their concerns about human rights. Right. It's very difficult, isn't it, when you're the self-appointed policeman of the world uh, to look at home and policemen, your own, are killing your own people. Exactly. But it's been like that all, always. You know, some of us who are part of the human rights uh, or the radical human rights community have been pointing that out for years, uh, that is sheer hypocrisy uh, for the U.S. to pretend to be uh, the protectors of human rights 
or, or to be the uh, the power, the uh, indispensable power, as uh, Barack Obama referred to the U.S. Uh, globally. Uh, when uh, many of us see, and I think international public opinion has uh, borne this out, people see the U.S. as a number one threat to international peace. The number one, now we say, the number one rogue state uh, on the planet. So yes, uh, all of these contradictions are, are coming coming home to bear and is making, making for a very, very interesting uh, and dangerous uh, environment. Unfortunately, I suspect that things are going to get worse before they get better. We are entering a, a sort of a pre-revolutionary uh, period. But it's not just the U.S. You can't understand what's unfolding in the U.S. And uh, you can't de decontextualize that uh, from what's unfolding there in Europe also. The global capitalist system is in fundamental crisis. You know, global supply chains have been disrupted. The global uh, commodity market has almost collapsed. Uh, you look at what's happening with, with oil. Billions of people who are living in abject poverty as a consequence of being incorporated into this world system. Uh, so it's quite clear that uh, neoliberal capitalism, globalization as we refer to this, this process, is unable to address the objective human rights needs of global humanity. So no one is coming out of this unscathed. Out of all the media analysis and all the headlines and all the newspapers, what is the one thing that you haven't heard from the media, uh, from uh, an analysis point of view, about what is happening and what has happened in the US? I think that what we are not seeing is, and not hearing, is that people around the world and in the US are starting to see themselves differently. That they are starting to recognize that uh, they are in fact part of a common humanity. And that understanding, uh, triggered by George Floyd, is being connected to an understanding of the inhumanity of economic sanctions, of uh, opposition to uh, uh, subversion and regime change, of opposed to the waste of the people's resources uh, for militarism and war. And so those connections are being made, but the corporate media, they're not raising those questions and they're not helping people to understand that people around the world are making those connections. And that's what I'm seeing that's going to uh, bring us out of this to a new day. Welcome back to Renegade Inc. Before we go back to the US to talk with the author and editor of Black Agenda Report, Margaret Kimberley, about the failing state of America, let's have a look at what you've been tweeting about in this week's Renegade Inc. Index. First up from Said Jones, what if America loved black people as much as they loved black culture? Next from TJ, I lost my aunt today. She's not dead, just racist. Finally, we have a tweet from Mark D. McCoy. George Floyd and I were both arrested for allegedly spending a counterfeit $20 bill. For George Floyd, a man my age with two kids, it was a death sentence. For me, it's a story I sometimes tell at dinner parties. That, my friends, is white privilege. Obama used to say this, it made me crazy, he used to say this all the time, America's exceptional, America's indispensable, which meant the rest of the world was dispensable. It's propaganda that starts from the time we're little, it's what we're taught in school, we are always good. And Americans love to think of themselves as good. Mm -hmm. Even if they're killing people somewhere, even if you're invading a country, it's for somebody's good, it's to help them out. You know, we're better than, that's why you have to demonize people, and Saddam Hussein or Assad, or somebody is evil and worse than we are, so even as our armies kill kill people or we get a proxy to kill people, it's because we are being uh, good. good. You know, it is kind of laughable, but it's also very dangerous. So you have a country full of uninformed people who think they're good, and even in their aggression in their country's aggression. Margaret, uh, great to have you back on Renegade Inc. Thank you so much. When uh, we talk about American exceptionalism, the images that are beamed around the world at the moment not very much uh, exceptionalism there. Why is the rhetoric uh, that, that comes out of America, why does it not match the reality on the ground? Well, America is exceptional, uh, but not in any good way. 
uh, exceptionally violent around the world with military bases all over the world, interventions, invasions, coups uh, against other nations, violent against its own people, exceptionally violent, more people in prison than any other country. Uh, the police killing three people on average every day, a thousand people killed by the police. George Floyd is just one of a thousand people who will be killed by the police this year. So the exceptionalism is not uh, anything positive. And uh, why is it uh, that uh, you have such a military presence uh, globally, uh, but you can't actually manage affairs internally? Well, I think the two are connected. Uh, uh, the fact that the U.S. has this empire is an indication that it's not democratic at home either. You can't have injustice uh, abroad but have justice at home. The two are linked. Uh, when you have a, a country that sees itself as having the right to do whatever it wants to anyone, then that ethos is repeated here. We talk a lot on this program about empires and the end of empires. Empires are often said that you know there's barbarians at the gates but realistically uh, uh, in reality empires uh, fall from within it looks to me that the uh, American Empire is falling from within and therefore you'll lose the um, moral superiority uh, that you beam around the world if you can't look after these internal affairs how can you possibly go and tell anyone else uh, what to do well you can't unless you lie so um, the government lies, uh, every president lies to us about foreign countries, the media assist presidents, every single one, even Trump, uh, the so, even so-called liberal media like the New York Times or the Washington Post, uh, when it comes to foreign affairs, they back him up. So no, you should not be able to say that, but they, and also the people are kept ignorant. You have to be aware of programs like yours. If you depend on the corporate media, you don't know what's going on in the world. So there's a lot of lying going on by people at the top and it keeps the population compliant uh, and uh, people don't even know what questions to ask. There is a huge call now to get rid of Trump. Uh, now, uh, if you've got half a brain, you can see his shortcomings uh, and deficiencies. If you get rid of him, uh, what then happens? I happen to think the odds are he's going to win again. So I think all this talk is wishful thinking on the part of, uh, of many people. Uh, the Democrats rigged their primary again. Joe Biden is the most right wing of Democrats. Um, I think he is less electable than Bernie Sanders would have been, but that's why they rigged it against him. They didn't want... Uh, uh, anyone to be their standard bearer who would actually uh, be asking questions of them. So there's no getting rid of Trump. You have to have an election, but that would mean having an honest election and letting the people decide who they preferred. But instead, again, uh, the Democratic Party are a little too clever for their own good. But actually, in this case, I have to say, I don't think they really care if Trump wins. I think... Um, this is like uh, like professional wrestling, and there is pretend opposition. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi will rip up his speech, but they Democrats give him everything he asks for. He's supposed to be stupid, a maniac, a crazy man, but if he asks for eight hundred billion dollars in defense spending, he gets it. If he asks for a space force, he gets it. Uh, I think they really are ready to sit this one out. Their first priority was making sure Bernie Sanders was not the nominee, and they were, they're willing to give up this election. So you're saying that the uh, American political class is basically equivalent to WWF? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. It certainly is. It's, uh, it's all show. When it comes down to it, the uh, horrific killing of George Floyd um, and uh, the associated police brutality that uh, we see uh, naked now across the US, um, these things are symptoms of a wider malaise, aren't they? The George Floyd killing is certainly the trigger, but the tinderbox was always going to go up. Why uh, is that? tinderbox uh, so volatile and, and always on the edge? Well, I think um, we had, uh, there was just revulsion. These cases become public um, often together. The media begin to pay attention. There was a man, Ahmed Aubrey, who was killed by, not by the police, but by uh, racist vigilantes, and that was caught on video. But we have a lot of suffering in this country. It's something that is not acknowledged. A lot of people are struggling 
uh, this quarantine uh, in the wake of COVID-19, the quarantines, the shutting down of businesses, there are 30 million newly unemployed people. And the response from uh, the uh, wrestling tag team was to give people a maximum one-time payment of $1,200. And we see what a failed state we're in. A lot of these people can't even access their unemployment benefits. And uh, so people are struggling. And I think um, a lot of people are in the streets because they're angry about many things. Cornell West recently said black faces in high places hasn't worked. Uh, he was referring, obviously, to uh, Barack Obama. Barack Obama bailed out Wall Street, not Main Street. Uh, I see that he's come out and you know, given one of his great pieces of oratory uh, of late. Um, that action, bailing out Wall Street, not Main Street, uh, how much responsibility does Barack Obama have uh, for what's going on in the U.S. today? Well, he has a lot of responsibility. He, um, you know, he was the uh, the better face for the ruling classes. George W. Bush was unpopular. The Republicans were unpopular. So they needed a Democrat. They needed someone they could market as allegedly bringing change, hope and change. So he was perfect for them. Yes, he bears a lot of the blame. The Democrats didn't even bother. Early in his uh, administration, the Democrats controlled uh, Congress, had the White House. They could have done anything. They could have raised the minimum wage. So uh, they could have done many things on behalf of the people. How now? Uh, with America so divided on racial lines, how now do you begin, does somebody begin to heal and unite this country? The healing has to come with action. There has to be a recognition that people are struggling and the government has to help them. There has to be a public means of helping people who are in very deep trouble. Uh, I think that will go a long way. Of course, as far as the police are concerned, monitoring the uh, police behavior has to be a federal government responsibility. These local uh, prosecutors hardly ever charge them. Uh, if, there are, if they are charged, they're rarely convicted. You know, I, uh, the cop who uh, had his knee on George Floyd's neck had no reason to believe he would ever face any consequences. Uh, there has to be some uh, grassroots leadership. It can happen. I think the police practicing more brutality uh, here in New York. We've had uh, police uh, driving uh, their vehicles into crowds, uh, beating up an old man. They knocked him to the ground. He's bleeding from his head. Um, I think all of these things ser are serving to wake people up. And I think if Trump wins again, uh, I think that will be a wake up call for uh, progressive Democrats that they must they must leave their party. They must do something different. Turns out that massive credit bubble and the bailing out of Wall Street uh, has created a huge complacency. People in your country thought that other people were looking after it. Turns out uh, they weren't. No, they weren't. And, you know, prior to the COVID pandemic, then the economy was not doing well. Right. But it's something nobody talks about. The press doesn't talk about it. Politicians don't talk about it. People have their lived experience, but it's never, those experiences are rarely acknowledged. Um, but I think now all, all bets are off. I hope that people stop accepting uh, this inaction or action that is um, actually against our, our interests. After 40 years of it, are these the last days of neoliberalism? Because the rest of the world is looking on thinking, you know what, we haven't got the kind of problems the US have got. Well, I hope so, but it's, uh, you know, I think the United States, the empire is coming apart, but we don't need an empire. Uh, that's not, people often speak of that like it's a bad thing. We don't need an empire. We need to have a country that meets its people's uh, needs, but there has to be a countervailing force. We can't just let it fall apart on its own because the end result could be even worse. You know, people like to call Trump a fascist and what they really mean is that he's obnoxious and they don't like him but we could have a truly fascistic system if this falls apart and there's no effort from uh, the bottom to remake the country. So uh, it falls a little bit to the rest of the world to try and talk you down <laughs> because you know a, a, a solid uh, and powerful America is uh, in everyone's interest. Uh, at the moment, uh, it looks like uh, sort of the drunk guy at the party. Yes, he is, but no one tells him to go home or takes his keys away. Um, so even when foreign leaders, they allegedly don't like him. Uh, Justin Trudeau was giving a speech and, you know, and, 
Uh, you can tell he doesn't like Trump. He was uh, talking about events happening here. But Canada does everything the United States tells it to do. Right. Um, and uh, that goes for the rest of America's allies. They are vassal states. And as long as they let the drunk guy stay at the party or let him drive his car home, nothing's going to change. It's funny, the countries that we're told not to like are the ones who stand up to the U.S. That's why we're told not to like them. Right. So everybody's supposed to hate China now, and they're using COVID as their rationale for hating China because it's the uh, economic superpower around the world. And uh, they're always mad at Russia because... Uh, uh, for the past 20 years, Russia has said, you're not telling us what to do. The days of uh, kleptocracy, um, you know, they talk about Russian oligarchs. They were fine with the U.S. as long as they let the U.S. do whatever they wanted right. uh, them to do. So when countries go their own way, that's when the hammer drops, that there are sanctions on Iran or sanctions on Venezuela. But Iran um, delivered uh, oil to Venezuela in defiance of the U.S. And that's what we need. And people need to be more aware um, so that they know when they're told not to like a country, um, they should stop and think about what that really means. So the multipolar world is here to stay. I hope so. And uh, that is all to the good. It benefits everyone. Margaret, always great to have you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.